Okay. Ready for a new session? Is uh, three hours too much? Okay. Let me know, okay? Uh, it's too much for me, but... Uh, okay, I changed this pay to buy, so now it's uh, at least correct. <coughs> in the same way, as in the supply curve case, there is, of course, other real variables affecting the price than only the quantity. The consumer's income will affect their ability to buy products, so if you increase the income of the consumers, you would expect them to buy more, okay? So that would affect the demand curve. Quality of the products could be an indicator. The design of the products could be an indicator. But both these two second points here, quality and design, could perhaps be realized through the price, okay? So you should expect that an object which has both a higher quality and a better design would by itself reach a higher price, okay? So uh, it may be that these two, number two and three there, quality and design, not necessarily are valid in the argument we make here. On the other hand, the last one there is obviously valid, isn't it? Because this is related to other more or less competing, which we refer to as substitutes in economic theory products, will definitely have effect on the demand for these products. If you look at a certain product, uh, a certain brand of coffee, and if that has a price of 10, and all other competing coffees has a price of 10, but then suddenly drops to 5, without the one we look at dropping to 5, then that would obviously have effect on the demand. So these uh, competing products or substitutes uh, is important when it comes to, to the demand structure. And in the same way as in the supply curve case, we can think of the demand curve drawn in the last slide as drawn for particular values of the three, which again, of course, should be four, shouldn't it? Ah. I, I tried to change it on the fly here. That didn't go. I will have to do it later on. Okay, it's, uh, the, again, again, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, again, a typo. There are four variables up there, isn't it? Income, quality, design, and prices. It says three in the text. Again, a typo. Sorry, four should it be. A change in one or several of these variables may produce a shift in the demand curve. So again, you can think of managing a multivariable function in a single variable function. So this is kind of to make it easier, basically, all the time. So in almost any case, yes, Monica? No, not necessarily. Substitution is about changing one product with another. Trade-off is about forces relating. It could be trade-off elements related to substitution, but substitution is kind of not an acronym for trade-off. Trade-off is much bigger in a sense. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the points should be clear. Okay, there are two curves that interest us. One curve is kind of related to the suppliers. We refer to that as the supply curve. It's, as we see it in the simplest case, the relation between price and quantity. The same type of cur or curve, of course, for the consumers, that's called the demand curve. Both of these curves are typically, in general, much more complex. Okay. But we look at simplified versions here, which are we are able to draw in a plane. That is more or less how it starts. Whether what conditions makes existence of supply curves or demand curves in the shapes we've seen here. We have not talked about it all. Okay. Or we did talk a little bit about it because there is some infinity arguments uh, coming at the point here which actually is necessary to derive these curves. So we kind of overstep that at the moment. Okay. Now we assume that these curves exist and they have the shapes we have discussed supply curve shapes upward and we find it hard to find examples on the opposite situation. Demand curves slope downwards. That seems reasonable but we can think of examples the other way for these uh, luxury products. That is where we are now. Okay? We have introduced these two concepts. We have discussed their uh, simplicity, their approximative nature and we have argued slightly for 
for their shapes. Okay. And again, let me remind you, according to your question, Isabella, it's a good question, but I, I suggest we leave it for the moment, okay? Because if we start thinking very heavily here on who can do what here, then it becomes tricky at this point. Yeah, yeah, you see, I, I just wanted to leave that question for the moment, okay? We may return to it, okay? But, uh, I would like, it, like us to try to think as simple as possible for the moment. <coughs> That is, by the way, the point here, isn't it? You shouldn't kind of ask too many questions at this level here, because the kind of the, he the whole story comes when we move along. Of course, keep keep asking questions. That was not the point. Don't misunderstand. Okay, and then we suddenly move to the solution, the market mechanism equilibrium. And to arrive at the, you have probably seen these arguments before. To arrive at an equilibrium, we kind of draw the supply curve as well as the demand curve in a single diagram okay and then of course as long as we assume that one is sloping upwards the other is sloping downwards there must be an intersecting point and a single one as well you agree yeah or is that correct maybe i'm lying now huh? So far, we haven't talked about what this means. Okay, we will return to that. Um, yeah, we have to go backwards in a way. We have to, in order to get more than one inter intersecting point, here, we, we have to have these kind of curves, don't we? They have to be local in the wrong direction. You see that? So as long as we keep to this assumption that it's strictly increasing and strictly downward sloping, then there'll be only a single intersecting point. To, to force not a single, more than one int int uh, intersecting point, we have to have different shapes, okay? So it's, that seems reasonable. <coughs> I didn't think about this before, okay. So this is nice. Given that this intersecting point really means something, then we can kind of at least seem uh, reasonable to assume that it's uh, only one of it, okay? Because if there were several, it could be a problem, given that it means the thing we would like it to mean. Because what it, we would like this to mean is the kind of market solution. And the argument is it's classical and simple. Let's assume the price is here in P2. Okay? Then we draw a line over here. Then we get an intersection with the supply curve, as well as an intersection with the demand curve. Okay? This point tells us what the consumers are willing to pay, no, yeah, or actually, how much they are willing to buy for this price. Okay? So cons consumers are willing to buy this amount down here to the price P2. This is higher than what the suppliers need, isn't it? They need this point down here to be happy, so to speak. Meaning that this uh, queue is forming here, isn't it? There's a queue forming outside the factory. This is a great product. You are, you are willing to buy much more than you offer us, or alternatively, we are, we are willing to pay a higher price for what you offer us. And obviously you get a force here moving in this direction, okay? So this will lead to increasing the price. So you move up in this direction and up in this direction towards this point. Alternatively, if you are on top here at the price P1, then it's the opposite situation. This is called shortage here, the opposite situation then demanders are only willing to buy this amount at the price P1, down here, okay? A bad figure, by the way. Suppliers are actually willing to put much more quantity into the market here, far up from here. So there will be surplus, there will be too much products lying around in shops, and of course this will have the opposite effect. It will send a signal to the suppliers that we have put too much products into the market. We have to take them back. Okay, so you get a force going down in this direction. These two forces will kind of end up in the intersecting point. So the intersecting point 
means something here. It's the point you should reach. So given that we have something called the demand curve, we have something called the supply curve, which gives reasonable representations of the situation we look at here, where all these other variables do not change, all these other stuff affecting do not change, then we would expect that given the market we look at, we should end up in this intersecting point. And in this intersecting point, two variables are established. The quantity Q0, which is the amount you would expect to be in the market, and the price P0, which is the mar market price you would expect to observe. Okay. But again, as I said, remember this first line I draw with general equilibrium monopoly? We, this is, of course, the general equilibrium as well. There's a lot of names for it. There is a lot of assumptions underlying here, which we kind of have overstepped now. And we have to kind of go into those assumptions to understand that we, in practice, never should use this model. That's what it means. And if we move from the financial market on one side into sport and event markets on the other side, it's even more reason to be observant, because in the sport and events scene, these assumptions are further from being satisfied than in, should we say, more normal markets. So it's even more dangerous to use this kind of model to describe these markets than, for instance, financial markets. Still, when we see economists talk about these markets, they tend to use these models, meaning that they draw a supply curve and a demand curve and say, OK, suppose we introduce this financial fair play system in Europe, Europe trying to affect how uh, football clubs spend their money then we could expect something to happen, couldn't we? That would uh, affect perhaps both the demand and the supply curve. Maybe demand would go down for football players, the supply would go down, so we will end up down here getting a much lower price. That would be nice, OK? They don't like these high prices on the football players because it's expensive for the clubs, OK? But my point here is that we should be very careful with doing that, OK? That is kind of a grave approximation. We need other tools, actually, to, to treat that kind of situation. So that is kind of the answer to this question down here, when can the supply-demand model, or the perfectly competitive equilibrium model, which is a, perhaps the correct word, be used? And I in principle, you should be very careful. You should be especially careful when we talk into the markets that interest us. OK. So this argument relies on the existence of, the, of a demand curve, the existence of a supply curve. Given those two existent, then it's kind of obvious that the solution must be like this. Okay. So the problem is really not this model, but it's the assumption that these curves exist and what is needed to make them be there in the, in the shape they have. Uh, if you think about this the demand curve concept, it says something about a price and a quantity. Now, if you think about a situation where, uh, which, which is the opposite of a typical monopoly, we, we, re, 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 we call it a monopsony, in the case where you have one demander and enormous amount of producers, okay? There's only one customer. And thinking that we have this relation then becomes kind of special, doesn't it? Because if there's only one guy buying, then they have to compete strongly to get this guy. He may say, okay, if you don't put the price to zero, I won't buy anything. Of course, that is not what this curve looks like, is it? Then you, don't, you can kind of think about the demand curve in this sense, OK? It, it's at least quite very different. So, so that is kind of more or less the point here, OK? It's, it, it, it is some assumptions here on, on the competitive structure within these two groups, which is necessary to kind of derive these curves and hence be able to use this argument. This argument can be used every time. No problem with that that you need the existence of a supply and a demand curve. OK. Questions? Basically, this is uh, the outcome of a general course in microeconomics. So when you end at this, you only have the monopolist case left to describe. <laughs> uh, so we have done this quickly now. Uh, but as you will see, the process of arriving at the demand curve and the supply curve is kind of involved. Okay, it's, uh, it's not straightforward. 
Now, if you think a little bit, let's return to this Mount curve a little bit, okay? If you think about sport and events products and you compare them to other products, let's pick a, a, a classical example, e electricity, for instance. Do you think there are different shapes on the demand curve for football tickets or theatrical tickets compared to the demand for electricity? Do you think these two curves should be different? Would you say that sport and event products are sensitive for price changes compared to electricity? Matt, do you think so? Yeah, I think so So as well. I think these uh, entertainment products are the most sensible products. That means that when you change the price a little, you get a big change in quantity. Agree? So if you lower or, or increase the price. So how would, how would it look then? So if you can think about the demand curve. Or should we say, what's it called? Entertainment? Yeah, we can say that. We would expect uh, some uh, behavior here, won't we? A small change in price produces a big change here. What must it look like then? It must, must be very flat. Do you agree? Isn't that correct? If it's very flat, then we get a reasonably big change here in quantity when we make a small price change. So what about electricity? That would be steep. Why is that, Matt? Because a small change in price does not make a change in quantity. A small change in price makes a very small change in quantity, yeah. Okay, then we have learned something, haven't we? We must be more careful in the event sense if there are price changes coming. On the other hand, if we are event producers, we are normally not competing in a, com in a, in a competitive market, are we? No, there is kind of more like a monopolistic situation, at least locally, perhaps. So then we can actually change the price. The local football team decides their own prices. So they are in a price changing situation. They can do that. As opposed to the financial markets, of course, where the market defines the price. And you cannot buy yourself. Uh, of course, you can, you can say to the buyer, I won't sell unless you give me this and that. And in that case, maybe the, the trade doesn't take place because there is a, a given price for it. So, um, but this is important, OK? This tells us that. We would expect special demand curves in the markets that interest us. Okay, they should be different than other markets. Of course, the electricity market is a very special market due to the fact that most people need electricity. So they can uh, kind of uh, swallow great price changes, still keeping up their consumption. Basically, it's perhaps, uh, apart from food, it's the, the last thing you would like to not have. So there are, of course, other products in between here, cars and computers and all that kind of stuff, which are not that important, but perhaps are more important than enter entertainment. There, of course, another thing about entertainment is that entertainment is something which is not necessarily sold to individuals, but to couples and families. You know that, don't you? If you look at football matches, there are sometimes families there. And it may be that not everybody in the family is just as happy in this consumption, okay? It could be a kind of a competitive situation on the buyer side within the, the unit that buys the entertainment. At least this is like me. I, I, if, if my wife wants to see a film which I don't want to see, I might say, okay, let's see the film. Being nice, okay? Yeah, that's not... Uh, we, we always adapt, doesn't it? So if I'm very interested in football, and I said to my wife, can't you come on this match? She said, no, oh, no, come on, okay, she says, okay. She said, you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway, to, to please me. If you think about electricity, it's not like this, okay? <laughs> it's not like a pleasing situation, whether you have it or not, okay? So, so there are all the differences, obviously. 
And of course, these kind of differences it makes it even more complex. Okay. Okay. Now, given that we believe in this model, or should we be more precise, given that we want to use this model as an example to tell how it would be if we were in a competitive situation, then we can start using it. It's, it's very easy to use, isn't it? We can say something happens which has the effect that, for instance, the supply curve shifts downwards. Okay? And then we can immediately predict what will happen, can't we? We start here, the price P1, quantity Q1, we move down here, then of course the intersection moves from this point to this point, and there is two effects, price is decreased down to P3, quantity is increased up to Q3. Okay, so it's a very easy model to use, okay? it's very easy to give illustrative examples on what will happen in an economy when different changes happen. And the only thing you need to know actually is, is to be able to take the thing that happens and construct it into a shift, either in the demand curve, or the supply curve, or both. Okay, so if you're able to do that, then everybody can be a good economist, can't they? By using this model. The problem is that it's kind of overused. Okay, that's my point here. Similarly, a shift in the demand curve, yeah, okay, in this case it shifts outwards, meaning that for a given price, more is sold, then uh, maybe wages are increasing, or taxes is going down, or something is happening here, you know, the positive on the consumer side. Then, of course, is what happens is you move in the op opposite direction, you get a higher price in equilibrium, as well as a higher amount sold. So there are two types of effects here. Okay. The third case, a, sim a simultaneous shift, both in supply, in this case shifting downwards, and demand upwards. You can see if this shift had been slightly less further down here, you could, could keep the price. Okay? The, the price change in equilibrium is quite small here, but the quantity change is quite big. So the, the price is kind of keeping more or less constant here, but you still sell a lot more under the new equilibrium. This is a kind of regulative action you like in, in many cases. Okay? You want to keep some kind of price structure fixed, but you want to sell more. You want to, you want to employ more teachers, for instance. Okay? Suppose there, yeah, there is unemployment. Okay? We want to empl employ more of these teachers, so we would like to reach this kind of situation where we have a minimal change in their wages, which is typically on these axis in that case. Of course, when you look at labor markets, it's typically the wage here for the, for the worker and not the price of the product. The wage on the worker is the same as the price of the product, isn't it? In the labor market, the price of the product is the wage of the teacher. So this is a typical situation you would like to arrive at. Okay? And then, then you can kind of try to, to, to kind of measure how far you, you need to put this down to keep the price constant and get the effect you would like in the labor market. Empl employ more people. If you are on the other side, you can do the opposite. <coughs> keep the price constant, change these shifts to, to make it go the other way around. If there's too many teachers employed, if you want to have more nurses employed, you want to, to kick off the teachers to become nurses instead. Okay. So this, this is a very nice model in the sense that it provides an easy graphical scheme for analyzing extremely complex economic situations. And that's the nice thing about it. Basically, that's the only nice thing about it. But that's nice. But you must be very caref careful when applying it in, in the real world. Unfortunately, most economists are not careful with that. At least if you look at the media site. Of course, if you look at the papers they write, then they are very careful about it. But when they are interviewed in, in television, they find it inconvenient to... <laughs> and you understand why, don't you? If, you? if you are to be interviewed in television, you have to come with the story. To make the story, you have to have these kind of tools. Okay? You can't say, ah, given that and that and that and that and that, it could be like this. On the other hand, given that and that, it would be the opposite. A journalist don't buy that, okay? That doesn't sell newspapers. So that's what it's like. Okay, any questions? Any more questions? Okay, elasticities. And elasticity is a single number which measures sensitivity of one variable versus another. 
Elasticity equals the percentage change that will occur in one variable in response to a 1% increase in another variable. So that means that if we construct a fraction here, where a change in quantity divided by a change in price, it should provide this information, shouldn't it? The percentual change in some variable can be constructed by taking the change absolutely and divided by the original amount. Then you find the percentage, don't you? Do the same on the other variable, then you get this double fraction here. And as you probably remember from yesterday, to take one fraction divided by another, you, you keep the first one and you turn the other one around. That's what we have done here, isn't it? We keep it on top and changed. Put the P on top, delta P under, then we get this. So this is an alternative way of writing this. Normally, we tend to do a little sort here. So we put the P here and the delta Q there, arriving at this expression. So this is the normal way of writing an elasticity. Why do we need elasticities? An elasticity, uh, you know what an average is, don't you? Yeah, you take a set of numbers, you add them together and divide by the numbers. It, it's a, a number that says something about, should we say, the point of gravity of a set of numbers, OK? You can think, I think, uh, of an elasticity, elasticity in the same way. It's a kind of a simple number that says something vital about the demand curve or a supply curve. It's a single number instead of an infinite amount of numbers. So this curve has an infinite amount of numbers, doesn't it? Yeah. So that, that's a great compression, isn't it? Everybody who's doing video would love this, OK? One number represents an infinite amount. That's good. <coughs> so think about an elasticity as a number which is uh, single, and it tells us something about demand or supply. We can talk about demands elasticity to supplies as elasticities. It depends on which curve we choose, the demand curve or the supply curve, to, to, to perform this calculation. This is referred to as a price elasticity or demand, as it uh, is the example here, in so-called discrete form, meaning that we, if you can observe two situations in a market, um, you can observe one price, another price, one quantity and another quantity, we can compute this directly by taking these differences and performing the calculation. But in many cases, it's more convenient to look, it, look at it in a continuous form. And in a continuous form, we replace this delta part here, this delta, with a simple d, as can you can see has been done here. Okay. And here, this dq over dp means the derivative of the function q with respect to the variable p. You remember how we constructed these derivatives? We made this triangle and took the, 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 the divided. It's the same kind of argument here. Okay? We just take, we subtract two numbers to get one of these, subtract two others to get the other, and then we divide them by each other too, in the same manner. So it's reasonable to assume that in the limit here, when delta something is going to zero, the difference between these two, Equilibrium points go to zero, it's reasonable to, to substitute this delta Q over delta P by this dQ over dP, which is a different way of just writing a derivative. Okay? So in this course, there are two names for this child then. We can write the derivative as something like this. Okay, that's one way of writing it. But alternatively we can write it like this. It means exactly the same, but it has some calculative benefits that you hopefully will not see in this course. Have you heard about a man called Isaac Newton? Yeah, he was a great scientist. Uh, and he kind of found out that, well actually he, he defined derivatives and he kind of developed all this stuff here. And he found out that this is a neat way of writing it because then if you have another derivative, then it turns out that you can actually reduce it. So you can kind of calculate with these differentials, as they are called, said to be. So it's kind of an extension of the of derivatives to calculating with parts of derivatives, so to speak. So this, of course, would produce another derivative then ref ref to the same variable but related to, to the same function related to another variable. But uh, this is just 
something we don't need to care about, I think. The point is that this gives us <coughs> an expression. Given that we have the demand or supply curve, uh, where we actually, based on an equilibrium outcome, can con con uh, sorry, can compute the elasticity, can't we? Because if we have the demand curve as well as, uh, sorry, if we have the demand curve, then we can construct this one, can't we? This is the derivative of the demand curve function. And if we have an equilibrium outcome, a point in time, observing price and quantity, then we have a P and Q. So given that we observe a market and know the demand curve, we can find the demand elasticity. Okay? Straightforwardly computed. But we need to have the demand curve. Okay. The other way around, given that we have the elasticity and make some assumptions about, for instance, how our demand and supply curve looks, then we can do a reverse engineering calculation and find the demand curves. And the reason why this is interesting is because there is a lot of countries around the world that actually publishes elasticities. So they make some estimations of these numbers, they put it out on the internet and in their yearbooks and so on. So this information is kind of available. And uh, in order to do our market cross and find the various equilibria, of course we need these demand and supply curves. We can estimate them ourselves by asking people, sending questionnaires, Observing and so on, that's kind of a lengthy process. So if we can use a single number, which is published by some public instance, in Norway we have something called the Statistical Central Bureau, which publishes this kind of stuff. In the United States they have the same kind of stuff in uh, almost any country. Then it's easier, as a quick fix, to use this elasticity to produce an answer. And I thought, uh, as the textbook actually mentions this, uh, we could take an example. But before we, before we do that, let's uh, read what it says in the bottom here. And el elasticity answers questions like, if we increase the price on our football tickets with 10%, how many percent reduction should we expect in number of spectators? This is a, an important question, isn't it, to get an answer on. If the local football producer here has, I would say, an average price of 100 crowns per ticket, says, what happens if we do like they do in Trondheim? And double the prices, because in Trondheim the average price is 200 crowns. Curiously enough, if you compare the quality of the two teams, by the way, that's another story. Of course, given that you have this elasticity, you can answer that question directly. Then you would substitute 10% with 100%, and you can then get this, uh, get this uh, question answered. Because the elasticity tells you exactly the, the, the value of the elasticity tells you how how your uh, how your uh, audience mass would be reduced in that case. And in most most cases, uh, asking these questions, the, the the answers provides information that uh, leads to that you don't do it. Okay. Of course, you would like to bring more mon money in. On the other hand it may well be that you do, don't really bring more money in because the number of spectators goes so much down that you, you don't compensate for the price increase. And this, of course, also is a trade-off situation, isn't it? If you're interested in finding the prices to put on an event, you need to take these kind of effects into, into consideration. If you increase the price, of course, each customer brings more money into your uh, system. On the other hand, the price increase will lead to less spectators coming, which produces less money. In. So there's a trade-off here. There's a certain point here, a price point, that uh, should be optimal. Okay, I see we are closing up. Maybe I'm not able to finish this example. I think we stop here, okay? This is enough for today. Next week, we start here. So we didn't actually finish chapter two, but we are close to finishing chapter two. So we're almost at plan, no problem, enough time. So then we move on with the final parts of chapter two and then we move on to the next chapter uh, next week. Is it, is it the same room? Uh, I don't remember this, uh, this schedule. We have to look at the schedule here, I think, again.
Next week, no, we start at A2, A3, and there is actually only one lecture next week. You see that? Only one lecture next week. And it's on Friday, and it's in room A2, A3. Yeah, this is out of my control. Okay, have a nice day. Have a nice week. A nice weekend. We don't uh, think like that. Oh. Okay. And you are talking about cause and relation, actually. You're talking about causality. What affects what? Who uh, comes first? This but uh, this is not uh, in the case here. Everything is kind of moving in both directions. So given that you can change price, then you will get an effect here. Given that you can change Q, you will take an effect here. And that's what I would like you to keep in the for the moment. Uh, yeah. So uh, just uh, according the formula uh, show yeah. in the Think Maybe the price can the, uh, the, the affect the... Yeah, you can say that. Suppose we can change the price. Uh, then, of course, if we change the price, if we reduce the price, then we get an increase in this direction. Uh, 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 Alter alternatively, suppose we can change the quantity here. Uh, uh, we reduce the quantity we put to market, then, of course, we get a higher price. Uh, okay? In so my think like that. education in China, and we also show the pictures like this, the X and the Y, and the X yeah. is always the changeable. Yeah, no, this is yeah. not what we do here. Okay? It's... Uh, uh, what it was, wasn't it? I think that oh, was yes, on the slides. And, and this is formula you read here. Yeah, but it doesn't matter then, because it, uh, you see my point. As long as you, you don't think as any as one variable is changed by the other not, it doesn't matter which way you write it. Okay? Yes. It's but the same, it's correct anyway. Oh, but, but I think the, the price is affected by the market. So why you show that this picture at the, the peak? Now this depends on what market you look at, doesn't it? If you are in a monopoly, then the monopolist can change the price. Oh. Agree? He can increase the price or decrease the price. Of course, there will be a consequence in how much you sell. If you are in the free market, you cannot change the price. So it's the market condition that defines which variables you can and should change. And at this moment, we try to do this without linking it to a market situation. Mm. If you link it to a free market, then the natural thing, as you say, is to have the only change here mm. and no change there. Mm. because then the price is given. Mm. But I would like to express this in general, in general. for any kind of market. Oh, no. And then I stick to the, my interpretation that, okay, suppose I can change that, suppose I can change that. Uh, okay. yeah. So just so to show that there is a picture, and uh, also we can, we can write a two formula. That is, one is P and one is Yeah, P. in principle you can. Yeah. Uh, that is kind of my learning to you today. Given that you do not link it to uh, only a, a perfectly competitive market, you both could and should do that. Because other markets, you're allowed to change the price and you should change the price. But of course, given that you have a demand curve or a supply curve, changing the price will then immediately produce a change in, in, in the quantity, mm. one by one. Mm. But the point is that if you look at more complex markets, it's not like that. Com compacted. Complex markets. Oh, complex. Yeah where you don't have an infinite number oh, and those yeah, and you're in between here, okay? So I think you should stick to my interpretation here and uh, you, if you like, of course, what you can say to explain your Chinese teaching here is that in that situation you probably only look at the competitive market. In that case uh -huh. it makes sense to say that X is changeable, uh, Y is not. Yes. 
because why is not change, changeable in a, in a competitive market? Yeah. Because the price is then given. Okay, you uh, you cannot affect the price. You can't change yeah. it. An individual can try to change the price. If I am in a competitive market, and everybody has sets a price of ten, if I put the price to eleven, then I sell nothing. Okay, uh, and I'm out of the market. So I can't do that. Uh, the market itself drives the price. The individuals together, because there is an infinite amount, and it makes it impossible for me as a single unit to affect it. is the big difference between the compacto market and the normal market? The big difference is that uh, in the normal market you have imperfections. In there is imperfections. You have asymmetric, asymmetric information, you have a limited number of competitors. Uh, There's a lot of things that makes market not ideal or competitive. And what's interesting from a political point of view is to, to kind of label those markets which are close to being competitive. You don't have to do so much about those. Those are far from. You may need to regulate, mm. to make them behave in the way they should. Mm. If I, as we discussed previously, know something about the stock market, somebody has told me that the stocks on Statoil, the Norwegian oil company, will go 50% down tomorrow. Today I will buy a lot, or oh. maybe I will sell a lot if I have. You S see? Stock market yeah. is the normal mar mar market. Uh, the, uh, most close to uh, a normal. Market. There is really normal no normal market. Uh, we in we in that sense, what if you call will happen tomorrow, and uh, they will change it uh, with uh, without any regular. Yeah, but yeah. for for the moment, oh, I think you, you should leave this, okay? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is good. Yeah. Not not go that far. Yeah. No, uh, for the moment, we <laughs> oh will we will uh, we'll return to it. Okay. okay? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the point is, mm. without defining the market you look at, mm. then you can allow ourselves to ask the question, what happens if P changes, what happens mm. if Q changes? Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the consequence is the same anyway, isn't it? Mm. As long as you have a function, the consequence is the same. Mm. It doesn't matter how you think about it. You put one number in, you get the other out. There's mm. a one-to-one -one relation here, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Then it was Monica. The thesis, yeah. the master thesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you told us to come and see you in regard to that. Yeah, you don't have to come now. You can uh, come mm. next year, for instance. Uh, oh, next yeah. year. Yeah, this okay. is kind of in the future. But uh, uh -huh. the point is that if you want to write your master thesis with another supervisor than we have here, that's that's mm -hmm. an option. Mm -hmm. And we have this list of people around Europe, which you can kind of pick one, and we will ask them, and if they say this is okay, then. Uh, you get a different, maybe different qualified supervisor that could help you write a better or a worse mm -hmm. thesis. That's up to the, the actual process. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. And then what does it take to write an academic book or an academic journal? To get into an academic journal? No, like what does it take to write an academic paper? Book? Yeah. No, to no be published internationally in an internationally referred journal? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What it takes, it takes a good idea. Mm -hmm. It takes a good knowledge of uh, the toolboxes of the topic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could be mathematics, sometimes it could be something else. Okay. And it takes a great deal of patience. Yeah. Okay. But you maybe, I don't know, uh, what uh, are you planning well to publish? Do you have some good ideas? Yeah, I'm thinking of some. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm just brainstorming and. I so in what uh, do we topic? Do we talk about uh, sport management? Or uh, more or less events. Management. Event management. Yeah. Okay. Do you know any journals on this field? Yeah, I was doing some research. Yeah. But that's online. And uh, I came across a few. Yeah, there's. I think there is one called event management actually. Mm -hmm. Not one. There yeah, there's there's a two or three or four yeah. of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you want to be a professor then? Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good to start early yeah, yeah. with publishing because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it was new to me, but I thought, why not? Others are doing it, maybe. Yeah, but you know, it's a, it's a patient process. Uh, okay. If you go for the good journals, then uh, it could take two to three years to okay. get something out from the starting point. Okay. Of course, you have to do the work as well. Sometimes you may cooperate with somebody, sometimes you do it on your own. 
this is normally things we discuss at the PhD level, not at the master level. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> if you move on to the PhD, then we will return to this matter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because then it's imperative. It's a part of the. But, uh, I'm I'm getting tired of publishing. I must say that. Uh, Oh yes, I have published a lot. You, if you if you look into the information here, mm -hmm. you can see on the board there is something oh. down here. Yeah. Uh, let me go back. Let me go back. <coughs> so you see where you can find this if you're interested in looking. Uh, this is the information part. Mm -hmm. If you go down here at academia.edu, you can see my my production, my scientific production. Uh, you see there are two books here, there are 46 papers, uh, oh. talks, teaching documents, videos, and a lot of stuff here, okay, so if you go in here you can, oh. you can find the papers, here is something which is not presentable, this is the last one, actually it's a philosophic paper, but this is uh, not, uh, let me give you something that might fit, uh, this is not available, here is a relatively recent paper, in an Italian journal. It's a sport paper written together with uh, two German colleagues. If you see what uh, we do here, you see that this is uh, there's a lot of work to do here. And can we make a game theory model down here somewhere? Maybe there it starts. And then it expands into... And then there's some math you can see. Not much. And there it expands, and it's suddenly a little bit bigger. So more math, even more math. You see, we use a lot of inequalities. I told about those, OK? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is an article, OK, published in a journal. It takes time. This one took uh, close to a year, I would expect, maybe more. These are the references, those you point to when you write it. You can read some articles. Uh, go in here and have a look, okay? And then you can uh, get a feeling for what, what this is about. Yeah, sure. Maybe. I didn't expect s events management to have all this. You didn't? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's good. Then we were able to surprise you. That's it's uh, interesting because when I was doing my A levels, um, the emphasis was on economics. And I, I, did I, I, sh I must turn this off. You're on tape now. Oh, no. No problem. Say any 